Join us today as we turn back to the Gospel of Mark to see what it really looks like to follow in the footsteps of Jesus. The reading is in Mark chapter 1, that's page 1063 in the Pew Bible, and it'll be Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 20. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness forty days, being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Father, these are your words. They are spirit and they give life. We thank you for revealing yourself to us through your word and through your son and through your creation. We look forward to what you have for us from this passage that we just read. We ask that you would strengthen Pastor Mike, give him clear speech and thought as he opens it to us. We pray that you will Keep distractions away from us, that we will be available to your spirit this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good word there in Mark. But imagine with me for a moment, if you will. Do a little walk through imagination. Imagine that you're at work. You're there, busy with whatever you normally do. And you notice somebody looking at you. You know that feeling, right? 
they have eyes on you, and, and you just feel, okay, somebody's watching. Now, normally, you know, our response is we look up, maybe we catch eyes, and then we get that embarrassed feeling of, oh, oh no, you know, turn away, feel a little embarrassed here. But imagine you're there, notice someone's looking at you. You, you look up, but you see who it is. It's a man. It's about as ordinary as you can get. Average heights, early 30s, dark hair, thinning a little bit. Uh, has a little bit of a beard. He's dressed in uh, jeans and a light blue t-shirt. Just standing there, looking at you. Decent clothing, you know, that he has on. Nothing ripped or faded, but certainly not expensive, not extravagant. And nothing about him would have ever caught your eye. He's one of those guys who you'd see in a crowd and not even notice. Not even notice in a crowd if you were looking. But he stands there looking at you. Your eyes connect for that moment. There's an odd intensity about his look. You know, almost like he can see right through you. Right through those walls, you know, you put up. Those walls that keep everybody out so they... Looks like you're standing up well, and in reality, things might not be quite there. But he catches your eyes, looks at you, and says two words. Follow me. Follow me. This absolutely ordinary looking man saying, follow me. What would you do? We can, uh, we can get wrapped up in our idea of the story of Jesus a little too easily without answering that very question. The question that the disciples had to answer. Answer to this man who really just showed up one day at their work and said, follow me. You know, beyond the, the stories and the images that we have of him, the stories and the images that we build up about this, what do you do when you are called to follow? So today, today we're beginning Mark's gospel. Now, as this gospel was preached, it was meant to be heard, and it was meant to be experienced as you went through it. In fact, if you, if you open up the gospel of Mark and just read through it at a slow pace, so that you can understand and feel it, it'll, it'll take a little under two hours for a normal reader to get through it. Enough for you to sit there and be part of the story. Because Mark is using his words in this gospel to bring you into the story of Jesus. Not as a passive observer, but as a would-be disciple. Having to grapple with those same questions that the disciples had to wrestle with. See, we're not just listen. We're invited to step into the shoes of the disciples here. See, when Jesus approached these men, these would-be disciples, he, he wasn't the image that we sometimes build up of him today. You know, Scripture says that he would appear to be the most ordinary-looking man out there. There was nothing about him, nothing in his appearance that would draw you to him other than the life that he was living. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. This is what Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 53. It's this man, not, not some mythic glowing image that we sometimes have in our art pieces and in our stories and in our books and in our stained glass that called 12 ordinary men to follow him. And yet those 12 men, they, they listened and they followed. And it is this Jesus who calls you to follow him. Now, of course, many can say, yeah, I, I follow him. I believe. You know, I, I, I said a prayer and I, I, and I hold on to, I, I believe he's my savior. And that's great and that's true. You may believe, it. in fact, into, unto salvation for that. But following means more than just an intellectual or an emotional assent. More than just saying that it's true. Following means be walking this journey with Christ in your life. So if you're going to truly respond to the call of Jesus, the call to follow him, then you need to follow in his footsteps. You need to take those steps. Respond to the call by taking up what he's called you to do, to take up that and be willing to pay what it costs. And that's what we see in Mark's gospel. That's the story that we get as we jump into it. And that's the question that we need to 
wrestle with the question of whether or not we're actually willing to follow. And in our story today, verses 1 through 20, uh, we see as we go through this, as Dave read it, uh, we have consequent, we have calls and commissions and costs that he talks about. We have three calls, three commissions, and three costs that Mark brings up in just these first 20 verses. And we can't jump to respond to Jesus without considering these things. So that's what we're going to look at today. If you're taking notes, I want to get that down. We're looking at the call, the commission, and the cost of following Jesus. Now we start by looking at the calls that Mark records to see what the nature of our call is. To see what it means to be called. See, Mark gives us three stories of receiving calls using the three main characters of our story here. John the Baptist, Jesus, and the disciples. These three. And they each received a call. It was their call to follow. And so we begin with John the Baptist. See, we start, we start where any good prophetic story begins. We begin in the wilderness. Out there in the wilderness. And it, especially in the wilderness at the Jordan. See, the Jordan is a place of decision. Those people hearing this story as Mark uh, reads it and recounts it to them, they would hear it remembering all that the Jordan meant. See, the people of God had wandered through the wilderness for, for all that time because they had been brought to this point of decision and God told them, cross the Jordan. You've been prepared, it is time to cross the Jordan and they refused to go. They refused to enter into the promise, into the victory that God had planned for them and so they were sent back into the wilderness for another 40 years before the children got to come before the Jordan and had the same question posed to them. Will you cross the Jordan? Will you follow into victory that God has called you into? And so hearing the story beginning there in the wilderness and at the Jordan, they could see that this is a moment of decision for them. This is a moment of decision in their lives. And so we begin it here at verse 1 where Mark says this, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. Now that prophecy right there, speaking out of Isaiah, that's the call that was on the life of John. Behold, I send my messenger. John the Baptist here. And this is the, uh, the cousin of Jesus, not the John the disciple, but John the Baptist here, he received this prophetic call on his life to begin the process of preaching this good news. He was called to prepare. He was called to preach. That was a call on his life. And here we are given the substance of this call. What is this call? Well, it's all about Jesus. You know, it says here in verse 1, it is the gospel. We start with that word. That's a great word. We hear it a lot, and maybe that enters into Christianese a little bit, and we can read through without seeing what it means or what it's, ta what it's talking about. What the word means is good news. It means good news. But when it was used, when Mark was writing this and putting this down, it meant a specific type of good news. Because a gospel is what the Roman authorities would send out whenever there was some momentous occasion that they wanted everybody to know about. Usually it was the birth of a new son to the to the to the emperor or when an emperor dies his son takes over his position in one of those cases it would be good news a gospel and so it would be sent out to the people for them to hear to rejoice good news we have a new emperor good news the emperor has a new son it was meant to be a great announcement but in this case it wasn't about the emperor it wasn't about the empire it wasn't about the authorities that were out there it was about one man Jesus. Here is the good news of Jesus. And it's Jesus. He's not only bringing the news. Jesus is the good news. This is the gospel of Jesus. It's his good news. But that news is that he has come. That is what John was called to start pointing to. That we have good news. And that good news is Jesus. And so, in this very first verse, Jesus takes up his title here, Son of God. Son of God. Now that is another one that has a lot of significance for the, uh, the listeners listening in on this. Now we know the theological significance. It's true. He is the Son of God. 
the second of the Trinity, very God himself. But this was also a declaration that would not have been missed by a Roman audience. Because this idea of some gods, well, that, that was out there already. See, only emperors were considered to be sons of gods at this point. See, when Jesus was born, the emperor at the time was Octavian, better known as Augustus. But this man, Augustus, went by the title Theos Uyas, or Son of God. Why was Augustus called the Son of God? Well, he was the adopted son of Julius Caesar. And when Julius Caesar died, they decided to place him in their pantheon. He was raised to the position of being God, and so Augustus was considered the Son of God. And they stuck with that throughout the next several generations, where the emperors were considered to be the sons of God. And so, even at this time, with Nero as emperor, as Mark is writing, at that time, Nero himself would, consider, would be considered to be the Theos Uyas, or the Son of God. And yet here it is, as Mark is writing, that this man Jesus, this man Jesus is taking this title. Both, in fact, theologically we know he is the Son of God, but also an authority for all these people. It was a declaration of war against that Roman system. Jesus is the true Son of God. Here is one who is greater than all these other men who you like to make gods, all these other idols that you'll put up. The true Son of God is here. And that's a bold claim. And that is the call, that is the substance of the call that John had. It was this prophetic call that God had spoke out of ages past that John would step up and begin to preach, to prepare the way, to make the path straight. That is where the call has taken him, on this way. Now John was called by God. It was a prophetic call. It was a prophetic call in his life to start this journey, which led him out into the wilderness, into the Jordan. And it's there, in the Jordan, that Jesus appears, and we see his call. So following John's call, we, we get the second call. The first one was this prophetic call from prophets from ages past, called to point the way to the gospel, the true of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now we get the divine call of Jesus. And I might say, wait, Jesus doesn't need a call. I mean, he's Jesus, right? He, he shouldn't need that. But you know what? He demonstrates for us what it means to be called. See, he patiently waited. He patiently waited on ministry until the call that he received there at the Jordan. Jesus, he, he came out of the wilderness, he came out to the wilderness, out from Nazareth, in order to be obedient and to receive the call on his life, a divine call. And we see that in verse 9 as we pick that up. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is truly the start of our story here. Everything before this, verses uh, 1 through 8, they were the introduction. But now we have our story. In those days, in those wonderful days of the ministry of Jesus, he came out into the wilderness where his cousin was preaching, and he steps into the Jordan, and he's baptized. Now get the image of John being stunned because he knew Jesus had no need to be baptized. He had no sin to repent of. He had no confession to make. But instead, he was being baptized as the beginning of his ministry. And that sign and reminder for us. So Jesus obeyed. He received his call. And for him it was that he was the well-pleasing and beloved son. That's the call in his life. For roughly 30 years, we really heard almost nothing about Jesus. There's nothing going on there. We, didn't, we don't know what was going on in his life. We don't hear that story. But now he is called. And his ministry is beginning here. And the world will be changed by that. And so we have the call of John. We have the call of Jesus. And so far we can sort of sit back and enjoy the story. You know, these are, these are our heroes. These are the great characters. Divine calls of greatness. These prophetic calls from way back when. Things that... We'll never know, right? Because we, don't, we don't have to concern ourselves with this because we're not like John. We're not like Jesus. 
But Mark has placed us in his story here. He's given us a place in this story. Now John, yeah, he might have been called by prof the prophets to come out into the wilderness. Jesus might have been there and called as the head before open. And the voice of God came and spoke out. And the Spirit descended. Amazing things. But where were the disciples? Where were they sitting in all of this? Where were they when they were called? The answer was, they were at work. They were just at work. They were doing the very things that the people hearing this story would be doing any Tuesday afternoon. Just the normal things of life there. Uh, just, just like us, you know, in the office, at the farm, working at home, whatever it may be. And into this situation, someone showed up. We get two, calls, two sets of calls here. Two sets of calls, each to two people. Uh, first to Simon and Andrew, and then second to James and John. While they're just sitting there, either fishing or preparing to fish. Uh, in verse 16, we see that passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, like they've done every day. For they were fishermen. That's what they did. Nothing surprising there. And Jesus said to them, follow me. And then in 19, going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them. Just called them. That was it. Follow me. Now what's going on there? Jesus, Jesus can show up in the most ordinary places to call someone. Now I find it pretty amazing here that as Mark is talking, he doesn't give any background. There's no background going on as far as do they know who this Jesus is? Have they met him before? And, you know, were, were they hoping to join him or join themselves to a rabbi? Was that something that they were looking forward to? We don't have any of that information. We're just told he showed up one day and said, follow me. Now I think, I think that it's given in that way so that we can easily step into their shoes for this. Remember, as he's reading, we're to be thinking about ourselves and the place of those disciples sitting where we would be as Jesus comes and calls us. Because this is the call that you may very well receive. Just Jesus calling. The question is, will you answer that call? That's the question being posed there. If you're supposed to be in the shoes of the disciples for this one, if you're standing there as Jesus steps into your ordinary life, telling you to do something extraordinary, what do you do? What do you do about that? See, don't think that the calling on your life is any different than it was for those men. We ended First Peter talking about just that. That we're not, we're not to be passive. We're not to just sit in the pews. We're not just to sit and listen. But we are called to actually step out. We are called to do something. See, there's a call on your life to do something for the kingdom. And Jesus is calling you. Now the good thing to remember, the good news here, is that Jesus is the one in control of all of that. And he's the one who should be followed. So will you follow him is the question. Because if you will, there is a commission that comes with it. There is commissioning. Now we might be familiar with that word commission, particularly in the military sense. You know, an officer receives a commission, which is their, their rank or their authority and their task, their duty that they're supposed to do. That's a commission. But if you follow the call, this call of Jesus, that's what happens in your life. You will be given a task and a duty. You will be called to something, and you'll be given the authority and the power to actually accomplish it, to step out and do it. And so we see Mark actually sets us up, now that we have three calls from the three characters, we get three commissions, how they are given authority and how they are given a task for each of these. And it begins again with John, John's commission. So if we take a step back to John's story, he's received his call, but he also has his commission on him. We see this in his life, how he was called to do this, to be this, to be the voice, be the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Picking up in verse 3 there, as we actually get what he was to do, he was to be the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. That was what he was to do. Prepare for Jesus. 
Now he did that by preaching this message of repentance, as, as it's called. Verse 4, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judah and all of Jerusalem, everybody was coming out there. They were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. See, he was creating a bit of a stir by doing this. But people knew he was a real deal. He had authority in what he said because he had been given a commission and he knew it. He was stepping out in that authority. See, they came from all over to hear him baptized. Now, again, we, we get into a mode. We know what baptism is and we've talked about it. And you know, that's part of being a Christian. Uh, but for these people hearing this, this would have been very radical. See, he's baptizing them for repentance and for confessing their sins. That's not how you dealt with sins as a, as a Jewish person. You dealt with sins through sacrifice, not baptism. In fact, baptism was only for Gentiles. It was how you entered into the Jewish faith. If you wanted to become a Jew and you were a friend of God, so one who believed in God and wanted to enter in, you could be baptized into being Jewish. Jewish people were not the ones to be baptized. And yet he is calling them out to be baptized here. And for repentance. That's a beautiful word. That's part of his mission right there. Part of his commission is to teach this repentance. It's the word metanoia. I love the sound of that word, metanoia. It's one of those fun ones. It, it means to completely turn around in your way of thinking. To have this, this turning around, not just of your thoughts, not just of your act, but your way of thinking and your way of doing life. It's to be conformed not to the world, but to the kingdom and to its way of thinking. And that's what John was hauling people into. And this was for them as he was preaching it, and as we see it, 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 it's process. It's not this instant action, because sins might be changed, but we need, to, uh, we need to move away from them, definitely. But repentance is a way of life that is seeking to live out the kingdom of God right now. That's what repentance is. And so John was called to do this preaching. He was commissioned with authority to do this work. And he did it willingly. Now he was also commissioned to have a little bit of a different lifestyle, as we see. See, in verse 6, it says, Now John was clothed with camel hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. Not exactly an encouraging image for all of us. Like, oh yeah, that, that's what I want to do. Now, now, you might notice something about this, though. The locusts, I get, that might be a bit much for some of us, but really, that was just, you know, standard fare for people who didn't have money. Uh, there were plenty of locusts, and so you would eat those, great source of protein, and, um, you know, they, they can try that, I have not. But that was normal, that wouldn't have stuck out. What would stuck out, stick out is this, though, what he actually had on. See, what he was wearing, and the way he was identifying himself, this wasn't an original outfit, uh, a suit of camel, or a cloak of camel hair, and a leather belt. Go with me, if you will, to, uh, if you want to keep your fingers there, turn to 2 Kings. We're going to go to 2 Kings here real quick. Uh, chapter 1, looking at verses 7 and 8. So again, that is 2 Kings, chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Because John, when he went out there, again, this wasn't just a uh, random outfit that he chose, but this was one that would be well known, almost word for word. And so I, I like this story where we get it announced to us, because where we pick this up, we're in the reign of King Ahaziah. Now the king has injured himself, and he thinks he's going to die soon, and so he gathers his messengers and sends them out, saying... Go over to the god uh, Baal Zebub, which, yes, sounds, should sound very similar, like Beelzebub. But go out to Baal Zebub, the god of Ekron. Go ask him, am I going to live? Because he really wanted to know that. So these messengers go up, but they get stopped by this man in the wilderness who gives them a different message and turns them back. And so they come to the king, and that's where we pick it up in verse 7 here. And he said to them, what kind of man... Was he who m came to meet you and told you these things, which is essentially, why would you go to another god? No, you're going to die. 
Well, they respond to him. His messengers then respond to them about what kind of man this is. And they answer, he wore a garment of hair with a belt of leather about his waist. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Well, immediately, because of that simple description, King Hezai knew who this was. Oh, it is Elijah, the Tishbite. Yeah, he didn't like him. Yeah, that made him upset. But there it was, Elijah the Tishbite. And how was he known? By a suit of hair and a leather belt. All That was all Ahaziah needed to know to see this was Elijah. Means that if we jump the centuries forward, as people see this man who is now wearing a suit of hair and this belt of leather, they can, like King Ahaziah, having most of them memorize all of kings and know all of that, they would be able to respond, oh, something is going on here. Someone, something is going on here. See, John was commissioned, was given the task even of living this way so that his life would be a proclamation. And that proclamation in this case is that he is the new Elijah come to point the way to Messiah. So we have this other one, clothes with the same, same clothing as Elijah, living out there in the wilderness. And he was called to be very different. I mean, we can see that. The other religious leaders of the time, oh, they wouldn't wear stuff like that. They had nice clothes. They, they ate the best food. Uh, but not only did he listen to God's instruction in that, follow his commissioning in that, but he was also very clear on the limits of his commission. So he, he understood the limits of his authority and where he stood. Verse 7, he preached saying, After me comes one, comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So John, John's commissioned to preach and to point the way. He knew that and he completed the task, but he was pointing the way to someone who would be greater. And that is where we pick it up with Jesus, who was also commissioned commissioned for his ministry, as we see the task that he had and that he took up. See, the first part of Jesus' commission was the preparation. He had some preparation to do. See, having been baptized in the wilderness, uh, having been baptized by John, he was sent out immediately out into the wilderness, away from the Jordan. As we see in verse 12 here, the Spirit immediately drove him out the, into the wilderness. Now, if, you, if you've been listening, you might have noticed that word immediately a few times already. In fact, in the 16 chapters of Mark, that word immediately shows up 42 times. That's a lot of times for immediately. It's the word euthus, euthus. And, and it has the idea of trying to bring you into that action. Mark is trying to teach it, have all this in such a way that we see it is active and we're joining in as part of it. And so we're going to see immediately a lot. But we have it right here as well. The spirit immediately, as soon as his head was out of the water, immediately driving him out into the desert, or out into the wilderness there. And he was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan. And he was there with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. Now we get the longer story in other, in other gospels, but here we just get the, this little snippet just telling us he was out there being tested. Uh, it says here, tempted by Satan. That, that idea of tempting is to put to the test. Jesus was be being put to the test by Satan. And that was the first part of his commission. That was the first part of his duty was to go be tested by Satan in the wilderness. And he's out there dealing with the wild animals, but he does have the angels that were there ministering to him. Well, Jesus was out there for 40 days being tested in this way. And then Jesus began to pick up the ministry just as soon as John finished his. Verse 14, now after John was rested, Jesus came to Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God after John was rested. And he was saying this, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe in the gospel. See, John, now arrested, he had been commissioned to point the way. That was his mission, that was his duty, point the way. Now Jesus and his demonstrated that he was the way. The kingdom was no longer just coming. The kingdom is now at hand. It was there and it found its center in Jesus Christ. That is where the kingdom was centered. Jesus was the way. So now here we are once more. 
with the disciples. And they're being commissioned. They're being given their task to do. See, John pointed to the way. Jesus was the way. And now the disciples are commissioned to follow the way. So, having just been called, having Jesus just appeared, they are sitting in their boats. And what are they to do? What is their task? What is their authority? Picking up again in 17, Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Now, what do you think that meant for the disciples then? Their commission was to stop what they were doing. To stop what they were currently doing. To get up and follow and be fishers of men. Follow the footsteps of Jesus to share the gospel everywhere that they would be going. Following in his footsteps. Just like the one that they were to follow, there was a test. There was a test immediately for them. For then the immediate test was letting go some of those things of the old life. You know, Simon and Andrew, they were called, and what happened? Immediately, that word again, they left their nets and followed him. James and John were called, and what happened? They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men, hired servants, and followed him. They were called, and they followed. They were commissioned, and they actually stepped into it. They started acting in that mission, that duty that they had. Now, we've got to be careful here as we're reading this, not to fall into temptation to just say, well, that's the disciples. That was way back then. That was their calling. I mean, the truth is, they weren't the disciples quite yet once they received their call. No, when they were called, when they had been called, when Jesus was there saying, follow me, what they were were four blue-collar workers in a rural town. That's what they were. They were disciples when they answered that call and stepped up to that commissioning. They were disciples only once they responded. But they responded and they were given that commission. As Mark tells this story, as this story is meant to be read aloud and for us to hear, we sit in the boat with those disciples. You know, imagine that. Again, Whatever, whatever you do during your day, Jesus has called you and he has shown you the commission. You know, he says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Follow me. Follow me and you will do the ministry I am doing. Step out of your boat. Leave the net. Do what I have called you to do. Now, if you have a relationship with Jesus, if you've accepted the truth that He is your Savior, you have this call on your life. Now, I know I, I lived nearly 18 years having known Jesus without responding to that call. Having known Him, uh, but keeping that call at arm's length, the commission at arm's length. Not, not accepting it, not jumping into it, not taking on the duty and, and the responsibility that he set up for me. I mean, I, I danced around it a bit. I, I definitely played church, and I, I did things. I put up good appearances. I, it looked good at, at a many, many points and at many times. But you know, finally, one day, Jesus really did just lay that out for me. He laid out that future for me, and he says, okay, we well, have to make a choice. You're either going to run after this stuff that you want in the flesh, or you're going to follow me where I call you, and you're going to take up this commission that I have for you. But if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to walk away from all that. You're going to have to leave your net. You're going to have to leave your home. You're going to have to do that and follow me. But this is what I have for you. This is commission. And I got to see that. And that's, that's what's before us. That's what's before you. Will you follow? Will you step into that commission? Will you take it up? So whatever you think that you're capable of, Jesus calls you to do great things. Now, maybe, maybe not great as the world would say they're great, but great things before Him. So He is calling you to follow, and He has a commission for you to take up. And the question is, will you walk in it? Now, of course, at this point, for many, there can be a lot of excitement as we 
look at that and we can say, well, yes, we want to follow. We want to partake of these great things. It sounds like a great journey. But the readers, the listeners, the people hearing this, knowing the lives of these disciples who knew their stories, they knew that the truth is that there is a real cost to following Jesus. Now, this is, this is not fear, but it is knowing the cost. Now, there is a lot of fear out there that will, that will say to you, well, what will happen if I step out? You know, there is fear out there that says, I can't do this. There is fear out there, certainly. And the truth is, I don't know what Jesus is going to do. He, he gives each of us our own particular commission. And these all look different and have different costs and have different things that we could be afraid about. But he has called, and if you respond, if you respond, he commissions you to do something for the kingdom and for the church. And there is no doubt in that. And in that commission, you will be asked to step out of the ordinary and do things that you don't think you're capable of, which is exactly where he needs you to be. But there is a cost. Again, not just giving way to fear, but there's an honest cost for these things that Mark doesn't hide from us. He makes it pretty clear there is a great cost to following Jesus for taking up that commission, listening to that call. See, each, each of the characters that we've seen, well, they get to deal with their own cost. We begin with John, the very first one. John obeyed. John listened to the call. John took up his commission. He preached as he was called to preach. He pointed out repentance and he pointed the way to Christ. He served faithfully. And what happened to him? He was imprisoned. Now Mark, Mark tells us that here, the very first hero of our story, in the very first chapter of our story, the one who's a prototype follower, he is thrown into jail. Now he doesn't elaborate at this point, but if you know the other Gospels, you know how it ends. It ends with John being beheaded. It ends with John being killed for this ministry, for having taken up this mission. There was a cost, a real cost, but John was willing to pay it. Then we get to the main character here, our main character, our Lord Jesus Christ. See, we know the cost. The people listening to this story know the cost that will be coming for Jesus' obedience. Because it was a reason that he had come. Following the call of God, the Father, and walking in the ways of righteousness, Jesus would be betrayed and executed like a criminal on the cross. There was a cost to pay. So what is the cost for the disciples? Now Mark, Mark leaves this one open-ended. He talks about the duties that need to be done, but he doesn't talk about the cost for these guys. But we know that it falls in line with the cost that we have seen. Which means there will be suffering, there will be sacrifice. You know, we just finished up First Peter, and that's pretty much what Peter talked about all the way through. The reminder that walking in this call, walking after Christ, there will be suffering and there will be sacrifice. There is a cost. And so if we do put ourselves in this story, if we do step in those... Uh, shoes of the disciples, if we walk in the footsteps of Christ, we need to know that there is a cost. There is a cost if we are to walk in this journey of discipleship following Jesus. So, that leads us to the question, what are we willing to suffer? What are we willing to give up? Uh, I think the question that hits me a little bit more is, what am I not willing to give up in my life? What am I not willing to sacrifice? Yeah, that one hits me as I give a list. One list, what am I willing to give up? I can, I can come up with a whole bunch of items, you know, because we can start small and, and be big. But there's lots of things you could give up. But what won't you give up? What has enough hold on your life that when Jesus asks you to surrender, when it says, this is a cost of following me, that you say no to him? See, this is often going to be the cost that we're actually asked to, to walk in. This is often the cost of discipleship. Now Mark doesn't know the specifics for everybody. But as you step into the shoes of the disciples, you will find out. Now sometimes this cost will be a, 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 a possession. Sometimes it is uh, an action to do or not to do. 
Usually, it's something, there's something that holds on to your heart that God whispers for you to give up. A thing, a thought, a person, a sin. And you hold tight, but you're asked to give it up. Now, if we look at the lives of the disciples as we know from here on out, each of them were called to do very difficult things. Many of them left their homes. Nearly all of them gave up their lives to pay this cost of following Christ. And many Christians throughout the centuries have done similarly. There's a cost. In this day and age, if you stand up for faith, if you stand up for truth, you will be attacked. Uh, especially for those of us on uh, social media, if you, you want to say something there, you, you, you will get torn down. If you speak truth, in the public spaces, it's not accepted. Uh, it's not the persecution that some Christians have known throughout the world, and many places still know. But there's a cost even here for going to actually step into what God calls us to do and take up that commission. You know, just like me, some of us can go years sort of holding that off. Saying, okay, God, maybe some other time. Maybe I'll pay that later. Maybe I'll step into it later. Holding off what he's called us to do because of that cost. So take a second and think about it. What would you hold on to instead of Jesus? What cost would you not pay? If you can follow, if you can give it to him, even if it's your own safety, even if it's your own security, even if it's own, those things built up, your own foundations there, what will happen is you will begin to rely more on God. And you will be embarked on this journey of following Jesus. Now, of course, what you might find as you pay one cost, especially when it's those things that capture our hearts and keep us from God, is that you might actually have more of them than you realize. More answers to that question, what you won't give up for him, that you need to walk through. I know that personally. I handle one, and I think, oh my goodness, that was one of the hardest things to give up. And then it's like, well, Mike, actually, you have all these other things too. It's like, oh, wow, yeah. You know, that's why somebody like Paul, the chief of all sinners, when we actually know how much we hold against God, you know, we can see that. We can see that. But don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged in it. Because that's repentance. That's the very repentance that John was talking about, that we would continue to turn our way of thinking towards God so that we could walk through those, giving up, paying the costs that are required, and walk in what he has called us to do. So, are we ready to follow? Are you ready to follow? Because we begin this story, we begin in the wilderness. That's where we stand. We stand at the river. We stand at that point of decision, whether or not we're going to cross over. Oh, God, my, you know, like with the Israelites, he saved them out of Egypt. He saved them. They had salvation, but were they going to walk in the victory that he had planned for them in the promised land? Or were they going, are they going to reject it and be stuck in the wilderness for another 40 years? So we stand there as well. We have a call in our lives, a call to cross over. We have a commission, being told what we are to do. But following is an action. You know, it's not just a, I follow in my heart or I follow emotionally. Without footsteps, it's not following. And actually following will mean that there's a cost. So there is a danger. And the question is there. Are you willing to follow? Are you willing to come? So you need to count the cost of this journey. Only you can decide if you're willing, if you're willing to follow. But even as we've gone through this story this morning, there is encouragement that, that, that you're not alone in this. There could be discouragement if we just think about all the things we need to do. But even in these short 20 verses, what we have seen is that, well, the prophets are out there speaking. God, the Father is declaring things. Angels are ministering. The Spirit is descending. There is a lot going on. There is a cost. There is a cost. There is so much glory. We will step out into discipleship. We will step out in being a disciple and following Christ. See, the life of a disciple involves suffering. But there is so much good to come. So he's calling you. Wherever you are, at work, at home, even right now, even right now where we are this morning, it, it doesn't really matter what image you may build of it in your mind's eye. He stands there, not like the flashy idols that sometimes we, we, are, we gravitate towards, those things that try and steal our hearts away. He doesn't offer us wealth. He doesn't offer us health. He doesn't offer security and stability. But he does offer us life. 
He offers us life. Not just existence, not just making it, but He offers us life, true life, a life of discipleship following Jesus. And so the question Mark has for us, the question that we need to answer is, are you ready to follow? Well, my hope in my own life and for your life is that the answer is yes. There's a call, there's a commission, and there's a cost. But it is so good to follow. And this morning, this morning we get to take a, a little step of following as we come before the Lord in communion and before the table. And this is a, uh, a good response to that call and a good time for us to think about what it means to follow him as we come before him in communion. So if you have your elements, please go ahead and uh, grab those out here. And I'm going to go ahead and I will, uh, I, I'll pray for us here, but I want to give us a few moments to just quietly think on just that. What, what has God called us into? What commission has he given us? And what cost do we know will be required of this? It's a lot to consider, but God is so gracious in walking us through those things. So let's, let's take a minute of quiet reflection for that. And then I'll pray for us. And then we'll join together in communion. So let us, let us go before the Lord this morning. Oh, Lord God, we, we thank you that you are our God in control, the one who has called us. Lord, I pray even now as we consider what that means, to be called by you, to be commissioned by you, to pay this cost of following, Lord, I pray that as we have prayed, that our hearts and our minds would be set on you, even as we've come before your table, as we come before you in communion, united as the body of Christ. Lord, may we walk in you. May we trust you. Bless this time, I pray. As we celebrate this unity, as we celebrate the call you clearly placed on us, Lord. Bless this time, I pray, and I thank you. Even now as we consider it, the cost that your son paid, that we might have this. That we can come before your throne, that we can enjoy your presence, and that we can be the church, the body of Christ united in one, seeking to live out your kingdom here on this earth. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for the love that you showed us through that. I thank you the love we experience from your son as he's taken that up. Lord, bless this time, I pray. Bless this time. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So here we see the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Scott, would you pray for us? the body of Christ.
In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Calvin, would you pray for us? blood of Christ. It's amazing remembering that we come together in unity that way. And even as it says, do this in remembrance of me, I'm reminded, hey, that's a, that's a commissioning right there, a task we are set to do. Do this in remembrance of him, but not just to stop with that, but to walk as though that's true. To walk as though we truly follow Christ, live that out in our lives. Now I'll ask uh, Pat to come on up uh, to lead us in our time of worship this morning. <laughs> 